excited to have you here today for a webinar um, called The Big Shift, looking at lessons learned in converting UC Davis buildings from steam to hot water. Our moderator today is Josh Morjong. He is the energy manager at UC Davis. And I'm gonna let him um, introduce our other speakers today. Great, thanks, Ali. Thanks to uh, Ali and the Energy Efficiency Institute for uh, organizing this for us today. It looks like there's uh, plenty of interest out there. We've got well over 100 um, participants now, so that's exciting to see a lot of familiar names and some new ones. Um, but yes, I believe all, all uh, attendees are muted, and your only way to uh, interact with us is, is via the chat or uh, for, for uh, questions that you want us to answer during this. Uh, at the end, we're going to have a panel session. We're going to ask you to put those in the Q&A, um, but we'll get to that. Let me, let me start with an introduction, um, and we have here a, a great panel of folks. We have, um, besides myself from UC Davis, we have Alan Suleiman from our design and construction management office. He's the project manager for this, um, this steam to hot water conversion project that's um, the district that's underway right now. And uh, he'll be able to talk about some of his experiences um, for, from managing the implementation side of it. So uh, some of you have heard about this project a lot in the past. A lot of it's been on the planning side and, um, and working up towards this, but now that we've actually uh, taking a bite out of the campus steam system, so to speak. We're going to be able to tell you uh, exactly uh, what we're learning from that process. So uh, we're excited to get to, to some of those details. Um, part of that implementation team has been the, the great team of consultants and contractors that are with us. So um, we've got two folks from Siemens, our controls contractor, and that's Andrew Jensen and Matt Hamilton. You can see them up there and um, they'll be able to introduce themselves a little bit more. You guys can also feel free to, uh, to reach out to them with more questions. Um, and Pia Scow from our um, cons design consultant um, and is the project manager for his team with affiliated engineers. So you're going to get to hear from him as well since he's been um, on this, this uh, train, so to speak, from the very beginning, um, the design and, and even the master planning effort and these um, now working through a lot of the construction administration side of it. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump into a few logistics and um, then we'll, we'll kick off the presentation here. Uh, so next slide, Ali. And our goal, this is uh, actually kind of a pre-webinar to what some of you already uh, have been to, our Global Energy Managers Workshop. We started a couple years ago. Um, on campus last year, we had to go virtual along with everything else, but uh, still had a really successful workshop. And we're looking forward to uh, one this year that's going to be, we're going to have some in person um, component to that as well. So we're looking forward to that in October. Um, if you if you were on a list that got information about this webinar, then you're going to get more information about that as well. Um, but that'll be uh, <clears throat> a very exciting time to get together for those who can be here. And then we'll have some virtual um, components as well for those who can't. Um, and obviously the, the theme will be about resilience um, and not just the pandemic, but other, other um, components and, and challenges that we've been facing as campuses. <clears throat> so with that workshop and with this one, we really wanna to get to practical um, challenges and lessons learned. And, and that's why we're trying to make this different than a, a conference where you just uh, hear about how everything went great and, and how wonderful people's projects are. And so uh, we're not going to be airing all the dirty laundry, but we're going to be talking about things that we hope you can learn from and, uh, and appreciate and, and take away for your own projects as well. Um, so some logistics about this webinar. Um, next slide, Ali. We're going to Try to keep it to, to brief presentations from each of the panelists today. Um, we don't want to you know, bore you or, or, or to lose you in, in this hour here, but we're going to try to run, run through those slides and uh, at least cover some of the high level topics that we, we have learned and want to share with you and then leave some time at the end for you guys to dig into those more with, with questions. So what we'd ask you to do is to, um, at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you should see a little Q&A button. So aside from the chat, you're welcome to send chats as well, but we'd appreciate 
um, it'll be easier to track if you can keep it in the Q&A and you can put your questions in there. And uh, we'll be getting to those questions at the end of the, the presentations. We'll have a, a panel um, time where we're all moderate and, and we'll go through the questions as many as we can get to at least. Um, and this is being recorded and you'll get a copy as well. So um, that should cover all those logistics. So we're gonna jump right into this. I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Siemens who's partnered to put this on for us and for you all. And I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, very excited to be here with you all today talking about uh, the big shift, uh, the transformative project at Davis and very excited to be investing with and partnering with uh, the Energy Efficiency Institute at Davis. Um, the opportunity to plug into this community and be part of this knowledge exchange is fantastic for Siemens. Uh, one, an opportunity we're very excited about. Um, just briefly, um, Siemens is on you know, our own climate journey, one that in many ways is parallel to the, that of the UC system itself. Our journey began in 2015 and while we're proud of some of the progress we've made to date, uh, we're very much aware that the hard work uh, is yet to come in terms of reaching our sustainability commitments. Siemens is a global organization. We have 290,000 plus employees, a global real estate portfolio of just under 90 million square feet of built environment and a vehicle fleet of over 50,000 vehicles worldwide and a staggering supply chain. 65,000 suppliers from 146 different countries. So we are, we are very pointedly aware that 2020 is in many ways the decade of action. The work we've done to date, the strategic planning, the carbon accounting has really just been the foundational first step and while we're proud of our position as a leader in this space in industry, we're far more proud of the collective impact we're able to make through business partnerships, like with UC Davis and the 750 other colleges and universities we partner with across North America. So excited to be here, to be plugging into this community. Thank you all for joining and uh, I'll wrap it up and turn it back over to you, Josh, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, I realized I, I didn't introduce myself. So for those who don't know, I'm the energy manager at UC Davis in the facilities uh, team. And so we're involved with this project um, more from the uh, operational side and, and have been involved in the planning of it. Um, so I'm gonna give just a brief context about kind of where this project came from. If you haven't heard that, um, just with a couple slides. Um, before we get into more of the details of the, of the implementation that we're going to focus on today. So the, the project comes out of our carbon neutrality initiative and the work we're doing on that front. Um, we're moving our campus towards this carbon neutral future. Um, there's a lot of information on our website if you want to look it up, bigshift.ucdavis.edu. Um, and, and really the, the focus with this project is to go after the largest source of carbon emissions on the main campus here at UC Davis, which is our, our steam system and the gas fired boilers that make the steam. Um, so we realized if we're going to carbon neutrality, we really need to do something about this steam system. Uh, we went through a long master planning process to look at alternatives and the best way to do district heating or really to do heating at all, whether it was district or, or another way. Um, and that's a separate presentation, but we landed on going to a low temperature hot water district system. Um, the biggest opportunity for us is to source the heat from our district cooling system, which may sound strange, but that district cooling system is a heat collection system. We're taking heat from the buildings and right now we're throwing it back into the atmosphere at our cooling towers. And so uh, what we're going to do with this project is be able to turn that heat into useful heat, that low grade heat in our, in our cooling system that we're collecting from the buildings via heat recovery chillers. Um, so that's one of the big reasons that we're doing this along with the other reasons like the losses on our distribution system from steam and a big opportunity for a renewal of our system, which was much needed. Um, so we're, we're leveraging a lot of these opportunities that were coming together and converging 
um, and turning it into a larger project. Um, we're doing it one district at a time, so we don't yet have the entire campus project funded, but we're planning it. Um, we've and we're we're working on on right now the implementation of the first district, which you'll hear about now. The goal, though, and the the master plan that we have includes um, this hot water system as a pathway to electrification for the campus. So having those heat recovery chillers allows us to source our heat um, through an electrical supply with the, with the heat recovery chillers. Um, and then when there's not enough heat recovery from the buildings in the winter, we can still uh, get heat with the chilled water system by running it into the ground in a geo exchange well, or by running it through air source heat pumps and, and to create essentially a false load on that chilled water system so we can still run those heat recovery chillers. So that's the long-term game plan is uh, full electrification using this, this hot water system as a, as a means and, and uh, through heat recovery. Um, but with that context, the uh, next slide shows that the present state is that uh, we've got a steam system on campus and we are uh, about halfway through converting this first district. So we've, we've broken the whole campus. This is a map of the main campus and this entire campus is on a district heating system. Um, those colored buildings represent the different districts that we've come up with in the master plan effort um, to break the campus into chunks that we can, we can uh, implement one at a time. And so uh, right now we're doing the red district and that piping is shown there with red piping and that's the project we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so we, we have plans for the other districts and also the heat recovery chillers. Um, those are coming next, hopefully later, uh, or hopefully the next project, but they're coming later. Um, so initially this, this hot water um, district is being fed from steam. So we're, we have some steam uh, heat exchangers that are making hot water at our central plant and at a remote location so that we can have this hot water uh, dis distribution loop to all these buildings in the red district. Um, but that's what we're going to be focusing on now. And there's a number <coughs> of reasons why we started with this district. Um, the piping distribution is well underway. Uh, we're, we, I would say we're uh, most of the way done with that and we're just starting on the building conversion piece of it. So there's been a couple buildings that have been converted to hot water and they're gonna be turning those on uh, to hot water this month. And so we've got some lessons that we're gonna be able to talk about now um, based on that progress and we wanna get into that now. So next slide and I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Tyus, is this you? Yep. Hi, um, I'll be walking you through some of the thoughts uh, for steam to heating hot water building conversions. Uh, starting off, we're gonna talk about the building conversion analysis, uh, which is basically, first of all, we need to determine the load uh, for each of the building and the appropriate load for each of the building. Uh, one of the things that you have to understand is that um, when these buildings were built, uh, they were designed by building engineers and a lot of times uh, those calculations are pretty conservative. Uh, but since we've been running these buildings, we have a history, we have a trend, we have an understanding of how the building is running right now. Uh, so the first thing we want to determine is whether the temperature is appropriate, the supply water temperature. Um, you know, Josh was mentioning about a heat recovery chiller. Those heat recovery chiller typically are good for about 160 degree reject the heat that we can send back to the buildings. Um, and if we're looking at 160, uh, for most of the building design through the years, they typically standardize on 180 degrees as being the supply water temperature and 150 degrees for the return water temperature. So um, we have to understand, is that 160 degree going to be adequate for the building? So what we're doing is to determine the temperature, we're going to do a winter test program. What this involves is uh, Josh's team will go out and turn down the supply water temperature for the heating hot water system from 180 down to 160 or 155. They're gonna slowly creep it down so that they can see how the building is reacting. And when they get it down to 155 or so, they can say, okay, uh, this building seems to be fine. There's no issues. 
Uh, so we should be fine to operate this building at this lower supply water temperature, that which is what's going to be produced by the heat recovered chiller. Uh, so the next item is how much heat load are we going to have for these buildings? Um, UC Davis has a great system where they have both steam uh, capacity calculate not calculation but measurements, and also the heating hot water. Uh, they actually trend that data. So trend data is the best method for determining the capacity. Uh, you can look at the you know the charts, and typically there will be a top bar area where it'll show you what the temperature is. And you're going to have to look through two to three years of data. And typically, the coldest month will be sometime in uh, December to February timeframe. So that's how you can determine it and the best way to determine it. But if you don't have trend data, whether it was never installed or the meter is not operating properly, uh, the temperature sensor is not operating properly, then you can go back to the original design uh, and look at how they designed the building, what kind of loads they uh, anticipated for the building. But realize building engineers, they typically use a calculation method that says no people load, no electric load, no lighting loads. And that's why what you're gonna probably see is that this data is gonna provide a higher than uh, reality uh, of capacity for the heating hot water load. So understand that when you're doing the, uh, when you're looking at your design of how much capacity you need. Uh, and the last one is you can go by BTU per square feet, but the thing is this is probably the least accurate uh, because it'll get you in the ballpark, but uh, you won't have the exact number or as close as you would like. So the next item, if you look at the bottom there, uh, we're saying maximize the heating hot water uh, delta T. Uh, so you want to maximize the delta T so that uh, you can get the lowest return water temperature uh, back to the plant. And that way you can optimize the heat recovery chiller efficiency. One of the things that you have to remember is that building return water temperature is not dictated by the supply water temperature or the heating hot water boiler or whatever. It's dictated by the terminal units. If the terminal units can do only a 20 degrees delta T, that's what you're gonna get out of the building. Uh, you're not gonna say, oh, I want 40 degrees delta T. It doesn't work that way. So remember, look at the terminal units, understand what the delta T is, and that will usually tell you what your heating hot water return water temperature is. So now the question is, how do we handle this load? Do we have a, a building connection with decoupled uh, connection or do we put in the heat exchanger? So the whether it's a decoupled feed similar to a water connection or building heat exchanger or hybrid with some that are decoupled and some have heat exchangers. Uh, this is really a university decision or the owner's decision, because in my opinion, the main deciding factor in the condition of the heating hot water is the heating hot water pipe in the building. If the pipe is in very good condition, why not take advantage of a decoupled feed? That way, you know, your supply water temperatures will probably be five degrees hotter uh, because you don't have the losses of the heat changers. But if you have a situation where uh, the, <clears throat> the building pipe is older and frail, um, you are concerned whether when you connect it to the campus distribution, the pressure could be too high and could cause uh, pinhole leaks or leaks in the system. So bottom line, uh, I think if you're looking at the pipe condition, that can decide for you whether you're going to have a heat exchanger or whether you can you know, run with a decoupled connection. So one of the other things that you have to remember is that uh, a campus distribution network uh, will have a pressure gradient. Uh, pressure will be higher the closer you are to the central plant. Uh, this could be a problem if the building has old piping system close to the central plant. 
but if you have a situation where the building has the older pipes, but it's at the most remote point, you know that the pressure there is going to be relatively low. It could be only 15 PSI delta P there. And there's not a, much a concern when you have that situation. Next slide. Design, build, delivery, um, that's the preferred. Uh, because many of these functions has to be done as part of uh, uh, the actual build out of the distribution system and the building design. So a design build delivery will give you the best of both world, uh, but definitely you want to prequal the contractors. Uh, there's a lot of contractors that may have feel for buildings. Others may have better feels for the outside uh, construction. Um, you want to have someone that will be able to adapt quickly and understand both steam and heating hot water. And you want the contractor to be the engineer of record uh, so that they're responsible to, for, for the work. Um, and in your specification, you want to have a requirement to deliver a complete and operable system meeting state, local codes, and university design standards. Because university typically have design standards or the owner design standards. Uh, if you put that on there, it'll save you a lot of detailing out of what the uh, design should be because each owner has a specific requirement. Now, point of connection, typically your point of connection for building job is five feet away from the building and that's where the symbols will stop and then the building people pick it up and bring it into the building. For this type of project, you want the point of connection inside the building. Uh, the reasoning for that is if you have it inside the building and have a bypass there, the distribution people can finish off their work, hydro test it, flush it, and get it all operable in preparation for the building conversion team. So when the building conversion team, they may not be on the same schedule as distribution people, but it doesn't matter. As long as the water is there, you're ready to go. Next slide. Um, I think back up one. A design build guide. You know, the first three of I've already talked about uh, the, the couple of feet, heat changer, point of connection, and also the differential temperature. The next one is, if you're gonna have a heat changer in the building, what should you have, braised or plate frame? Uh, this many times is decided by the owner, uh, usually the facility people, uh, because they're the one that's gonna to have to maintain it and repair it. And sometimes, you know, plate frame sounds great, uh, but the thing is, uh, by the time you rip it apart and try to put it back together, uh, chances are you're, ordering a complete plate, a plate pack uh, for the heat exchanger. So if that's the case, wouldn't it be simpler to just have a brace heat exchanger and disconnect the connection and hook it back up with a new one. Uh, and sometimes you're forced into plate frame as you get larger heat exchangers, you're forced into the plate frame anyway. So the other thing we wanna talk about is pre-conversion tasks. Uh, one of the things that the UC Davis has done, which is great, is, you know, with the pot feeders, uh, they basically converted those to pot feeder and filter. And what it does is it creates a, like a side stream uh, filtering system. And this works out really well, and we have implemented that and seen good results uh, with the filtration. But then the actual construction of the skid package, you should have it as a manufacturer skid so they can bring it into the building and place it where it has to be and bolt it down and hook up for connection and you're ready to go. Uh, this slide, I kind of made a slight mistake on this. Uh, the manufacturer skid should be about 34, 34 and a half inches so that you know it can fit through any of the 36 inch doors. So just remember, think about the doors and what it takes to get it in. Uh, matrix of responsibility for contractors. 
Uh, this is a necessity because a lot of times there's discussions while well, no, it's your responsibility or it's mine. Uh, next slide. So this is what we put together. Uh, basically it identifies what the scope is, who the primary responsible party are. Uh, initially it's the master engineer or the university's engineer. Then as you move along, you'll notice that the primary engineer uh, shifts over the primary responsible party shifts over the contractor and their engineer of record. Uh, this clears up a lot of items and it also identifies all the requirements of the project. Next slide. So we're thinking, well, uh, the only thing we have to worry about when we're doing a conversion is um, the, the actual uh, space heating and water heating. That's not the case. Uh, there's always sterilizers in a lot of universities and kitchens with soup kettles and dishwashers. Remember, you have to find replacements for these. And typically you'll put in an electric steam core for the sterilizer and you'll convert the kettles to steam. Uh, you'll convert it to electric or gas, preferably electric so you can take care of your carbon neutrality concerns. Next slide. And then water heaters, if you're talking about a classroom or office, electric water heater is a simple way to go. And there's really not that much demand in those type of buildings. So you can get it right off the shelf, plop it in and you're ready to go. Uh, steam radiators, they tend to be a little more of a problem. You're gonna have to put in a new distribution system and then <clears throat> have steam radiators uh, converted over to heating hot water radiators or buy new ones that uh, will handle that. Uh, so, you know, don't think of it as just being, oh, I can install heat changer and I'm done. Next slide. Uh, controls is also another item uh, in IT requirements. Um, it's more than just a BAS control system that you're looking at. Uh, if you take a look at this, the first item is the utility grade BTU meter. Uh, the metering department will want to know exactly how much energy a building is taking. So that needs to go on specific VLAN. Then you're going to have for certain buildings controls uh, for the central plant pumps uh, so that you can control the VFD and ensure that you're basically pumping the right pressure for the situation. Our goal is to have 10 to 15 PSI delta P a delta T at the most remote building. Then if we have that, we know our heat exchanger is working fine and everywhere else in campus is fine. And then finally, you'll have the BAS that's required for the buildings themselves. Next slide. Coordination is a very important part. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is the, uh, the university's design guide. Sometimes those Design guides will have global statements of how they want to design. Uh, for example, the global statement may be provide a control panel for each building. And that sounds great, uh, but those global type statements are really for uh, a single building installation. Uh, but the thing is, you know, for our steam to hot water conversion, we may involve have 30 buildings or more. So adhering to those global standards, uh, it may take a big chunk out of your budget. Uh, so, you know, go through those, get agreement between the university, different departments of what will be included and what will not be included, even if it's global statement. And the other thing about coordination, have more infield meetings. Uh, whether it's the pre-bid, design development uh, review walks, or field meetings to resolve issues. Doing a field is a lot quicker. You can see the actual situation, resolve the issue quick, uh, quicker, and get the construction moving. Next slide. Uh, campus standards, update university steam to heating hot water design standards as early as possible. Uh, remember, this project may take three to five years, depending on the phases. 
make sure that new buildings meet the new standards so that you don't have to convert the buildings, construct them in parallel with your project. Um, I've seen it many times where uh, we're doing our project and other buildings are being built using an older standard and then you have to come back and install it based on the new standards of uh, steam to hot water. So just keep that in mind. Next slide. Andrew. Thank you, Pius. Um, so again, I'm Andrew Jensen with Siemens. Um, I've been with Siemens for about 20 years. And amazingly, I've worked um, with the University of California Davis for almost that whole 20 years. So my role um, in this presentation is to talk specifically about the energy management system, the BAS system, and lessons learned through the design phase for the project. So a lot of these will be similar to what Pius had mentioned, but um, early collaboration between all of the stakeholders, the controls vendor, the design team, and the EMS stakeholders on campus. Uh, that'd be the control shop, the energy conservation office, the people who um, own and are responsible for the, the EMS server. Get everybody on the same page with what the goals of the project are and what the standards are that they want to implement. And then meeting with the team to understand really what the overall project goals are for the client um, as they relate to the EMS system. Are you going to be replacing and um, control panels in the hot water system plants in these buildings? Or are you going to be retrofitting them? And, and what, is their what is their goals and object objectives? And then agree to standards um, across the buildings. I think we identified that pretty early on for this project that this was a very unique opportunity since we were going to be touching on this phase of the project 26 buildings in one project we had the ability to really standardize the look and feel of not just when you open a control panel and see what's inside of it but the programming and all of the sensors used the sequence of operations so that standardization that early conversation is important to to, to begin those um, creating those standards uh, during the design phase or even the pre-bid phase I would also encourage um, early investigation of each building's mechanical systems and what the existing energy management system is. Um, in this case at Davis, we were dealing with 26 buildings. Many of them were 50 plus years old um, with multiple revisions of control systems over the years. And the existing control systems might be 10 years old, 15 years old. So having a clear understanding of what's there so you can under you can plan on what you have to adjust and change and modify for the project is a key piece. And then once you have all the information, getting that incorporated into the design documents um, and or the bid documents. So in this scenario that um, for this project, the university chose a design build um, scenario and <clears throat> for procurement of the project. But they had, had to build bridging documents and those bridging documents need to be have some clear scope as to what the requirements are and it'd be very helpful down the road and then as i had mentioned coming to an agreement on standardizations from the sequence of operations to which controls points you're going to require to the equipment types so what flow meters do you want to use what valves do you want to use so that every building gets converted with with the same equipment and this will help the maintenance team um, for the campus for years to come and then real specifically, um, the control panels that you're installing. Um, we're choosing on this project to pre-build those panels so that they all have the same look and feel. Uh, the controller's in the same location, the terminal strips are set out the same way, and the panduit's all the same way, so that when the facilities and controls maintenance guys come to those panels five, 10 years from now, and they open the door, they all look the same, and they can quickly analyze what they need to do to fix any problems that arise. Next slide, please. So key considerations for the built inside the buildings um, as they relate to the control system. Um, I had mentioned in existing buildings, what is, the, what is the current type of system is also important. Not just the control system, but what type of building is it? Is it a forced air VAV with hot water reheats? Is it a fan coil system building? Is it a dual duct system? Having an understanding of what the rest of the building is and what the control system is for the rest of the building will help then you dis determine what will trigger the hot water system to activate? And you may have um, want to adjust supply water set points over time. What are those triggers in the sequence of operations to, to make the system go? Another thing we ran into was some of the older buildings 
were two pipe systems. Those are buildings where you just have a single um, hydronic loop that can that serves the building that can either have hot water or chill water running through it and then there's a seasonal switchover. In this scenario, um, we wanted to have one control panel, one brain, if you will, one program for both the hot water and chill water scenarios. And then what are the keys to switching those over? What is the, the sequencing that you want to have built there um, for the hot water switchover? What will trigger that? And then with the fact that it's a two pipe system, is there any modifications to the chill water system that need to be done as part of the project to make everything work together? Another thing we found was some of these older buildings have been expanded and added to over time. And so there, they have been, they have added additional secondary hot water loops within the building. So you might go into the mechanical room and see four hot water distribution pumps, but through multiple investigations and then old as built, you find, well, wait, this is two different loops within the building, making sure you incorporate that into your design and your requirements about what activates the hot water system again and then how those pumps are controlled. And then <clears throat> Pius had mentioned this, um, getting your IT department engaged in the project early. And then how, you know, how will the new EMS controls talk to the building's existing system and then the campus's system? Um, some of these buildings at Davis are, like I said, pretty old and they are not ethernet based. And how do we convert the, the new system to ethernet based controls and make sure that it all works together? Uh, next slide, please. Here's just a typical example of a decoupled system um, that we ended up standardizing on for this project. I think about half the buildings that we're doing conversions on, maybe a little bit more, are decoupled. Um, it's just a pretty straightforward control sch schema um, with a BTU meter for energy metering on the left. The, the vertical piping is the campus loop. I know the text is really tiny here. And then everything right of that is the building side. Um, the university has added what we call an economizer valve and a bridging valve for future control so that they can then do um, delta T control within the building to maximize the, re the return water temperature back to the plant. I think Pius had mentioned this, but once they get their electric heat recovery chillers in place, they will want to maximize the delta T at the building to send back the coldest water possible to the plant in order to make the whole system more efficient. And then just this is just a standard two pump um, redundant pumping system, lead lag and staging if needed. Um, in this scenario, there's an end of line differential pressure sensor. This is another key thing to consider in older buildings. Um, many old buildings may be constant volume. And as part of this project, you might be reconverting them to variable volume while well, determining how you will do pump control on that when there is no existing end of line differential pressure sensor in the building. Installing that will be um, pretty expensive and difficult in an existing building. So you may want to end up just doing what I call plant differential pressure. It's just downstream of the pumps on the supply and return for pressure control. Next slide, please. And then here's an example of their other types of buildings that we have. A single heat exchanger building, which is very straightforward. Uh, a, a single valve for supply water temperature control. But I show this to, to illustrate, if you do go to a dual heat exchanger scenario, it does increase the level of complexity for controls needing to be able to stage the heat exchanger. So you have to add isolation valves on the building side um, of the loop so that you can turn one of the heat exchangers off when not in use. This will remember need to have lead lag and staging programming added to the system so that you get equal runtime on the heat exchangers and that you don't end up getting um, one of them stagnant and fouling over time. So that it's always available for you. That's the, the end of my slides. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, this is, uh, I'm Alan Suleiman, uh, project manager for the design build uh, building conversion. Um, I'll run through my slides real quick here. The, I'm gonna talk about the, walk you through some of the decisions that we made in the delivery method for the, uh, as Pius uh, alluded early on that the pros for design build is it's a faster design. You, you focus on the uh, basis of design, uh, but it also allows innovation and field solution. It, um, it creates a single point of uh, responsibility for the contractor and it shifts the risk uh, from the university to, to the contractor. 
um, the cons is also by being uh, shifting the uh, the control of uh, of the design is actually you're getting a design that is maybe less than optimum. However, it has to still meet the design guidelines of the university as well as local codes and, and regulations. And the quality control gets to be a little uh, more of a challenge in the uh, design build. Another other key considerations throughout is, is to make sure that the site is well investigated since you have older buildings and, and existing condition as, uh, as Andrew was talking about. A, a very good um, information available to bidders would be a, a report on the hazmat that's available, uh, that's present in these old buildings and uh, a way to uh, know it early on so they can, there's just so no, no surprises and any questions. And, Main thing is also develop quite the partnership between the end users like the facilities and energy office and building occupants uh, with with the design and involve them in in the uh, understanding the control strategy. So so again, everybody is is happy uh, with uh, as we move along. Uh, and these are uh, lessons that should be or like lessons being learned because we are in the first couple of buildings of twenty six. And uh, we are still be learning on on, uh, on on the things that uh, did right or we should have done. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, as Pais alluded to, also don't assume that the entry point uh, is the same as the one that you expected to be on the building conversion. So, the distribution side of this, where uh, will be bringing in the point of connection into the building, they may encounter a lot of unforeseen conditions in the on site where there's a, uh, a, a some old abandoned uh, grease trap or something that where the the entry point was designed and then later on discovered that you can enter the building from that location. So you, so then you have to adjust. And then the, on the building conversion side, you have to also adjust that design. So keep that in mind. And uh, when you, if you can, pick the first building very wisely because um, this way you'll have try to have a building that has less labs or no labs and in classrooms that be affected uh, as you learn along. Because you you will um, you will learn a lot of stuff that you didn't think about. And as having that in um, in the, the first building, then it'll be a little bit more more forgiving, because there's a lot of variation in these buildings, and every building has its own uh, variation, a very specific and, and its own character. So clarify this assumption, and communicate with the occupants very early and very often. Uh, so that's really kind of the theme of how you can have a successful. Um, implementation where you can uh, have less surprises. Next slide, please. Where I'm going to talk about basically coordinating that with the building. If you meet with these building managers, uh, they're the CAOs, the PIs, the others, the, the building that uh, the occupants of that building. And for us, we met with them a year before we even broke ground uh, to inform them about uh, what's going to happen. And then also a month before. Uh, to remind them of that, because everybody will be forgetting what, what we told them. And there's a lot of changes and changes in personnel and staff. And also, as we enter each building, you know, a week or two, we'll, we'll just communicate with them again, how's the interruptions going to be, where they're going to lose domestic hot water or industrial hot water, and even interruptions in electric or steam or, or um, any service that they are utilizing especially buildings that would have labs that dependent on steam for uh, sterilizers or uh, uh, lab operations. We also have uh, part of the contract is providing a temporary skid, like temporary heater for uh, these buildings where it actually, if, if, uh, if, if and when and where it's needed. So uh, for example, for the summer construction, we're not worried about heating the building, uh, so there's no need for that. However, if there are labs that are running, we need to provide them a temporary uh, steam. We also uh, kind of um, baked in where the 
steam, uh, whether if we're putting in electric steam generators, we're making sure that these are installed and up and running before we uh, uh, disconnect the steam to the building. So this way, the interruption is very minimal uh, for the occupants. Um, also uh, will be considered for uh, the, the, uh, the usage of these buildings, like if, if there's a vivarium and there's gonna be disruption in their uh, experiments or in their uh, daily operations. So that's where uh, we will make sure that we communicate with them to minimize uh, the disruptions that they have. I think that's the end of mine, Josh. Yeah, thank you, Alan. That was a great job, everyone. And I really appreciate all the answers that have been coming in. Um, if you haven't looked at the Q&A, uh, we've, we've been trying to answer questions as they come in, just type in answers. Um, if we didn't answer your question fully, um, you can uh, retype it or, or ask a follow-on question. And uh, now is a chance to put in any other questions. We've got about just under 10 minutes um, to, to answer questions you might have from for any of our panelists. Um, so feel free to put those in the Q&A section. Um, we got one that just came in. Pius is working on a few answers here, but feel free, Pius, if you want to just speak up and, and, and uh, answer them um, verbally as well. Vocally. Yeah, um, <clears throat> there's a question in lab buildings. Are you installing large water heaters, electric or heating hot water through heat exchangers, or are you installing multiple smaller ones? If we're looking at um, uh, IHW, uh, typically the demand is fairly great. So we are doing it as part of the skin uh, so that you'll have uh, the low temperature hot water from the campus go into a IHW skid, then we'll um, store it uh, in IHW tanks. And typically these tanks will be about 200 gallons uh, because again, we're thinking of that 36 inch door that we have to go through. So you may have a little tank farm, of maybe two or three, uh, and I'll give you a buffer for our IHW system too. Great, so um, yeah, I mean, wherever we're, we're replacing all of our steam heat exchangers, uh, steam water heaters with either low temperature hot water, uh, this new hot water system to uh, the heat exchanger to whatever building hot water system there is there. In a couple of places we're putting in small domestic um, hot water heaters that are just electric if they, didn't, if they don't have much usage or it wasn't worth putting in a connection to the um, new hot water system. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. Um, Pius, did you want to, I, I don't know if you have an answer on project cost in dollars per MBH. I don't know if we've done that. Um, uh, I did answer that one. Um, You're working on it. No, I, I did answer that. And it's a little difficult uh, because it depends on the mechanical room, how complex it is. Yeah. If the system where you can build your uh, skid and everything adjacent to the area and do a cutover, it'll be a lot cheaper. Uh, if you have a congested building where you have to put a temporary uh, heating unit somewhere else, then it starts adding up. And also uh, the worst one is if you have um, some steam heat exchangers or steam radiators, then the cost goes up quite a bit because the steam heat exchanger has to be converted over to hydronics, then you're gonna have to pipe the distribution uh, and if you have radiators, you're talking about running the heating hot water distribution system uh, to put in radiant heating, whether it's a wall type or not. So uh, it's hard to have a, you know, a good gauge because it, there's such a big factor with a complexity factor. Yeah, and I would say as far as uh, pitching a project to campus administration, or if, if that's the angle you're looking for, I think you have to make sure you look at avoided costs too, because a lot of this, um, you know, we were able to, to frame it against avoided costs that we would have had to put into the steam system, whether it's additional capacity or renewal of existing steam um, lines or, or heat exchangers in buildings and things like that. So that's a, that was one, one, one of the ways that we were able to get this initial uh, piece funded. Um, so we, there's a, there's some questions about the underground and 
Um, I, I think that's going to be a separate lessons learned presentation. We, we, this one was focused on the buildings. We've got Siemens here and Alan's our building conversion PM. There's a, his colleague did the underground distribution side. Um, and I'm sure we have tons of lessons learned on that front. Um, yes, absolutely. Maybe you can speak either Alan or Pius to the, the question, the comment, which is a fair one about the roads, uh, you know, not looking like they did before the project went through. And I think that's because it, we're, we're not done, right? Yeah, so, we, are, we are not done. Uh, basically, uh, that's a two-step process. Um, they're patching it and whatever they put in there, it's going to settle. So as it settled, they're going to repack it and they're going to then um, put on the second coat that will be flush uh, with the existing asphalt. And also the turtles or whatever other the designs at the circles, uh, they're going to be restored. Yeah, great. Um, I think we're going to have maybe a little more questions than we're able to answer here, but I'm going to try to pick a few more. Um, there's, there's a question about the steam heat exchanger to hot water that we're currently using to, to um, as a source of heat. And um, that it, we're keeping that for now, um, but it, it's not a permanent solution. Um, I think you're right. As long as there's still steam, we're going to keep our, our boilers until end of life. Um, and that steam heat exchanger is still valuable as long as there's steam to connect to. Um, but the goal is to get out of that co completely. Um, yeah, um, a lot of it is uh, when you bring it to uh, a central plant, you want to have a fair amount of load uh, for that central plant, the heat recovery chiller plant. Uh, so the what the steam heat exchanger does is give you a capability to convert more buildings quickly off the steam system that converts it to heating hot water. Uh, so th there's no efficiency benefit to using these heat exchangers. Uh, it's for the main purpose of being able to convert 20, 30 building, then dump that 20, 30 building onto the heat recovery chiller. So that heat recovery chiller will be happier too. Um, I have worked on the Stanford project also, and we basically had four or five of those chillers. We converted the entire campus over to heat and hot water. Then we cut over the heat recovery uh, central plant chillers. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, just to be clear that the heat recovery and the chill water were, uh, the reason that's cost effective is all we would have to do is, is uh, you know, when I was talking about winter adding supplemental heat, when there's not heat to recover in the buildings, all you have to do is pump that chill water into the ground in the geo exchange well. Um, operationally, very low cost. You've got to drill the wells, which is a cost. So that, that still remains to be seen if, if we're going to be able to go that route. Um, but yeah, if, what, the goal is to be out of steam completely. So we aren't going to have steam to run a steam heat exchanger eventually. Um, as far as end of life of the boilers, we have a boiler we put in about 10 years ago. And so, um, you know, we've still got another. 15 years on that boiler probably. Um, so that gives us a little bit of time for a transition. They'll, we'll probably keep it at least as a backup um, as long as it's got some life on it. But uh, we, we have a number of older boilers that we're trying to uh, not need anymore as soon as possible because we don't wanna put any more money into them. Um, so our goal is to get as much of the campus onto hot water as possible in the next uh, five years or so so that we can get our peak load down and not, not put more money into boilers on the boiler plant. A um, couple of quick ones. We're not planning to use any of the steam piping infrastructure. It didn't work out for, for sizing. And, and that, that the reason we're doing this is a lot of that infrastructure is very old and, and uh, in need of renewal anyways. Um, and that's also a galvanic corrosion concern uh, because with steam piping, your temperature is much higher so that any moisture that leaks into the insulation, it's going to evaporate off and you're not going to have galvanic corrosion. But with heating hot water, um, if any of the water leaks in and connect, connects up with a steel pipe, you're going to have galvanic corrosion and that pipe won't last long anyway. Yeah. Um, and then as far as insulation on the hot water line, we uh, that's all being done. It's, as I said, it's direct buried and it's being done with uh, gilsolate powder insulation. Um, uh, 
I see Alan or, or Pius, this is a question maybe, do you anticipate further development of the campus design guide to include standard details to govern the way the heating system should be implemented at each building? I mean, I think this is, this is definitely a learning process where we're having to do some new, new stuff. Well, that, that, is, <clears throat> that ties into the slide that I had regarding uh, uh, updating the design guide. You do want to get that in as soon as possible. Uh, so you cut off um, designing to the wrong process. Uh, and uh, we should have it right now so that uh, any future buildings, um, you know, it'll be coordinated. Uh, the way we're doing it right now is the PMs are coordinating with, uh, you know, our PMs being a building conversion and building distribution uh, PMs. And that's how they're controlling it to make sure we don't have an issue. But it's always better to have a guide that everyone can look and understand. And the design guide is, is a living document. So as we learn more, we add to it. Okay, I think our, our time's up. We hit noon here. Um, we didn't quite get to everything. I want to just invite anyone to send any of us questions um, and uh, reach out to any of us with your questions. We'd be glad to try to help. We obviously are still in the learning process. As we said, we haven't finished this project yet, um, but we hope to be able to continue to share with anyone who's got interest. And the slides will be uh, sent out along with the recording. Great, and I'll also in the email follow-up, we'll send out emails for um, the panelists so you can uh, know how to get in touch with them if you have further questions or want their contact info. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much for attending everybody. Yeah, thank thanks you. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.